And I just wanted, to, before I read her credentials, there we go, I uh, wanted to thank um, the Amy Clampett Fund, who is responsible, for, a very generous sponsor of not only this poetry reading, but of the infrastructure actually of the whole festival. And so um, without their support, uh, frankly, this word fest would not have been possible. So we are deeply grateful to the Amy Clampett Fund. So. <clears throat> And now I'm honored to introduce to you one of the nation's leading poets, Mary Jo Salter. Thank you, Susan. So I thought I would begin um, by reading a poem of Amy's. Um, this last book, A Silence Opens, was published just, just before she died in 94. And so mo many of the poems in her last volume were written in Lennox. Um, and that, that book, uh, m many of the poems from that book are in her selected, uh, and you can learn more about her in that, in that book. But uh, what I wanted to read, she was a great, um, great birder, and she knew a tremendous amount of, uh, about wildflowers in particular. And she wrote a poem called The Horned Rampion, um, which I love in and of itself, and it also, itself is going to recur in one of my own poems that I'm going to read to you later. So I thought I'd start the reading with Amy's poem, and I will end the reading with my poem about Amy. If I can hold on to my pages. Okay. The Horned Rampion. Daily, out of that unfamiliar, entrancingly perpendicular terrain, some new and on minute inspection marvelous thing would be opening. Yet another savory, flowery permutation of saline or salvia, of scabious, of rock rose, of evening primrose, of bellflower such as the one I'd never before laid eyes on the like of spurred, spirally airy, a sort of stem-born baldachin, a lone, poised, hovering rarity, hued midway between the clear azure of the rosemary and the aquilegia's somberer purple that turned out to be named the horned rampion. Next day, it was no longer singular, but several. The day after, many. Within a week, it was everywhere, had become the mere horned rampion, had grown so familiar I forgot it, had not thought of it since, it seems, until the moment a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, pulled down for some purpose, fell open at random, and there was the horned rampion, named and depicted, astonishing in memory as old love reopened, still quivering. The wind is blowing. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. All right. I'm now going to read a poem that I wrote in Lennox. Um, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, but um, I was walking through town and I came upon some Morris dancers. And um, I thought they were pretty ridiculous. Okay. So here we are. A Morris dance. Across the common on a lovely May day in New England, I see and hear the Middle Ages drawing near, bells tinkling, pennants bright and gay, a parade of Morris dancers. One plucks a lute, one twirls a cape. Up close, a lifted pinafore exposes cellulite and more. <laughs> oh, why aren't they in better shape, the middle-aged Morris dancers? Already it's not hard to guess their treasurer, her, their president, him, the Wednesday night meetings at the gym. They ought to practice more or less, the middle-aged Morris dancers. Short-winded troubadours and pages, milkmaids with osteoporosis. What may, really makes me so morose is how they can't admit their ages, the middle-aged Morris dancers. Watching them gambling and tripping on maypole ribbons like leashed dogs, then landing thunderously on clogs, I have to say I feel like skipping the middle-aged Morris dancers. <laughs> Yet bunions and receding gums have humbled me. I know my station as a member of their generation. 
Maybe they'd let me play the drums, the middle-aged Morris dancers. <laughs> Okay, so the rest of what I'm going to be reading, is, these are all poems from uh, a forthcoming book with, uh, coming out next year called Nothing by Design. And I've always liked it when poets have a little dedication that is itself a poem, so I, I finally decided to do that. The book will be dedicated to my daughters, and that's the title of this little poem, To My Daughters. Heavy in the womb, at birth light as a feather, not even your own mother can understand that riddle. Or how you'd fill the room although you were so little. Or how, once you had grown, you weren't there to measure, yet stubbornly would loom larger than anyone. The next poem is uh, dedicated to one of the poets under this tent, uh, Daniel Hall. Uh, my old friend, and two other friends, Peng Yu Chen and uh, Kanan Jagannathan. They were with me uh, at the National Aquarium in Baltimore um, when we all saw uh, some images that Dan explained to me were fractals. So um, I hope the poem will explain it, and if not, it's a light poem, and so it doesn't really matter if it explains it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's called Fractal for Dan, Pengyu, and Jagu. A fish-shaped school of fish, each individual shaped like a single scale on the larger fish. Some truths are all a matter of scale in the manner that shale will flake into thin layers of and like itself, or a roof is made of shingle upon shingle of roofish monad. Scale fish, school of fish. That's a fractal, isn't it? Was your feedback when you ate what I said. A form that's iterated. Output is input ad infinitum. Must I now mull it over? I mulled it over. This aquarium, I thought, was a sort of think tank for non-thinkers in their open-mouthed safety in numbers forage, needing no courage. Yet so beautiful, mathematically serving one end while swerving in a fraction of a second into action. How do they sense when to advance or backtrack, tail that guy, or swallow the law to follow? Somewhat in the line of Leib Leibniz, Mandelbrot, co Mandelbrot coined the term fractal. It's the hall of mirrors parthenogenesis of a recursive, nonce, anonymously irregular form, i.e. copies no other formula can make. I learned that when I got home. An eye on either side of a flat head is useful, I read. Herring have a keen sense of hearing, but it's not that that gives them their unerring high polarity, pooling together just close enough to discern skin on a neighbor, far enough to skirt collision. That's a vision scaled for fish, but what human can marshal acceptance, much less a wish for sight so partial? Stand back from the glass. Make room for the universe, I thought then. At least for whatever we can compass. Iteration on iteration. Until fish fill, fill the ocean. The next poem is, um, I have to thank another person in this room. Um, uh, John Hennessy, editor of the magazine The Common, comes out of Amherst Col uh, College because this poem appeared there. Um, we, we are moving from one large kind of tank, that is to say the aquarium, to another, which is a, a, a huge con a, a concert hall. So imagine yourself at the very height of a concert hall. It's called The Gods. I always seem to have tickets in the third or fourth balcony, a perch for irony, a circle of hell the Brits tend to call the gods, and peer down from a tier of that Empyrean at some tuxedoed insect scrabbling on a piano. <laughs> some nights there's a concerto and ranks of sound amass until it's raining upward, violin bows for lightning from a black thundercloud. A railing has been installed precisely at eye level, 
which leads the gaze frustrated still higher to the vault of the guilt-encrusted ceiling, where a vaguely understood fresco that must be good shows nymphs or angels wrapped in windswept drapery. Inscribed like the gray curls around the distant bald spot of the eminent conductor, great names, Da Vinci, Plato, Whittier, Debussy, form one long signature, fascinatingly random, at the bar marble base of the dome. It's more the well-fed gods of philanthropy who seem enshrined in all their funny, decent, noble, wrong postulates, and who haunt these pillared concert halls, the tinkling foyers strung with chandeliered ideals, having selected which dated virtues, courage, honor, brotherhood, rated chiseling into stone. Having been quite sure that virtue was a thing all men sought, the sublime a mode subliminally fostered by mentioning monumentally. All men. Never a woman's name, of course, although off-shoulder pulchritude gets featured overhead. And abstractions you might go to women for like beauty, justice, liberty. Yet, at the intermission, I generally descend the spiral stairs unjustly for a costly, vacant seat I haven't paid for. Tonight, I've slipped into D9. The lights dim, warm applause, and, after a thrilling pause, some stiff-necked vanities for a moment float away. All the gorgeous, nameless, shifting discordances of the world cry aloud, aloud at last. I close my eyes. I'm going to reverse the order of a few things. Um, how am I doing? Um, this, I have two poems about divorce to read. Um, one is fierce and one is wistful. And those of you who have been through it know that you have many more emotions than that. This is the first one. This is the fierce one. It's called Complaint for Absolute Divorce. A little something to endorse. Download attachment. Print and sign Complaint for Absolute Divorce. The lawyer wrote with casual force. Yet why complain? The suit was mine. A little something to endorse complaint. Sheer poetry, of course, more lofty than lament or whine. Complaint for absolute divorce, so well phrased, who could feel remorse? That absolute was rather fine. A little something to endorse the universe as is, for worse, for better, nothing by design. Complaint for absolute divorce, let me salute you sole recourse. I put my birth name on the line, a little something, and endorse the final word then in divorce. OK. 